and we are going live in three, two, one. Hi, everybody. We have a very exciting discussion today um, with Mersa Bharadaran, the author of The Color of Money. Uh, this is a very important book that looks at the history of Black wealth and the history of Black banks in the United States. For those of us who provide counsel and work within the financial services industry, it's vital to understand the history so that we can understand where we are today and how we can move forward together. Um, many of you on the call today are members of our team uh, or other folks within Edelman. And I think all of you have received or you may have a copy of this book. Um, I encourage you to read it. Again, this history is a, an important part of the industry that we work within. Today, we'll have a chance to hear from Mersa on a little bit more about that history, her personal perspective, allow, allow her to expand and expound on some of the, uh, the, the key takeaways and key moments of this history in that book. Just one in particular, Mersa, early in, in your book, you talk about the Freedmen's Bank. Uh, which the history there and the reality there is shocking. Uh, and it's, it's an it's a important uh, thing for all of us to be aware of. Um, again, many of us are providing counsel, reputation counsel to members of the financial services industry, all aspects of the financial services industry. This history, both distant history, but also recent history, um, is an important factor in reputation assessment, but also should be considered as part of reputation strategy for participants in the financial services industry today and tomorrow. So I see this as really important uh, education, really important knowledge for us to be fully informed counselors uh, within, within this sector. So Ashley Lewis, I wanna thank you, Ashley, for uh, organizing this on our side. Once again, I want to thank Marissa Baradaran for joining us. And I'm going to hand it over to Ashley. Thank you, Lex. Can you all hear me? Okay. Okay, great. Um, Marissa, it's fantastic to finally get you uh, to be a part of this conversation with us. I know we tried this summer with our um, financial services um, retreat, but scheduling conflicts and, um, but you're here today. So we're excited to talk mm -hmm. about your book, The Color of Money, Black Banks and the Racial Wealth Gap. Um, this is probably my second or third copy, but um, Lex, you know, is a phenomenal leader in the fact that he actually purchased our team um, a copy of the book and ensured that we were reading it. And, you know, again, to his point, you, when we're advising these clients, our clients, ensuring, you know, you don't know where you're going until you know where you've been, in, in a sense. So I'm um, happy to have you here. So thank you. Thank you so much for having me. I'm really happy to make it work. This is exciting. Uh, so first question out the gate, again, mm -hmm. about the book, what inspired you to write it? Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, for listeners who may have not necessarily read it yet, what takeaway or lesson um, are you hoping to share with readers? Um, yeah, this this was not the book I intended to write. Actually, uh, the the book, you know, I kind of let the research take me. I, I actually um, started this book about ten years ago, wrote a whole other book and a bunch of other articles before finishing this one because I had to really sit with um, where I was going. I, I initially started it actually just. I mean, I started it as you know, kind of looking at what what happens with immigrant banks these these jewish banks and german banks and italian banks and i'll talk a little bit more about those different subgroups and and how 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 did those become part of or not part of the sort of you know banking system the mainstream banking system and what what is it specifically about black owned banks and and that that legacy that was different and what does it say about the banking system that you have had all these outside banks and are they able to create money and create wealth in this in the same way if they are in a segregated community. And, and I kind of figured that my thesis was going to be no, that you need to kind of plug in to some credit system. But um, as I started digging into this research, I, I kind of, um, you know, there was a lot of really great work on the you know, immigrant bank experience, but it, it, it just became uh, sort of apples and oranges, you know, to talk about black banks in the same breath as talking about these Irish banks and Italian banks, it just wasn't yeah. the same East. And so I just decided to follow black banking. And, and that was 
initially going to be the book and I, you know, uh, did it with Harvard Press. And, and so it was just a very academic, you know, let's just focus on black banking. And, and slowly as I uncovered and kind of led through the kind of the materials, especially uh, maybe since you you've read it all the way through um, with the Nixon stuff and post Nixon, yeah. I I was really um, surprised by where this research was taking me. I um, spent months in the Nixon archives and was was sort of floored by how purposeful some of these pivots and specifically black capitals on which I, I go into um, were. And you know, as I was finishing the book, sort of you know, I finished the book as everyone assumed that Hillary Clinton was going to win the election. Yep. And then I did, you know, kind of did the last chapter as, as it was clear that Trump was was going to win. And, right. and really kind of, it, it, it kind of hit home for me that this whole Nixonian path that we went down, it, specifically in that 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 racial element had come to, to fruition. And, and it, it, you know, I was thinking as I finished the book, I wanted to scrap the whole thing and just write that chapter six, uh, the, the yep. Nixon story, because I felt like that, that was the nugget that I had not anticipated and that enveloped the book. And then it became angry. You know, I, I started it as a very academic enterprise, but I, uh, the more edits I did, the, the angrier I got at how, um, you know, it, it wasn't an accidental exclusion. I think that's how I had learned about it. It was, I mean, yes, there was like the way things were, obviously slavery was, right. you know, and the redlining was, but, but recently, not accidental. It was very purposeful, yeah. very, very um, pointed. Um, so that that was what inspired me to write the book and and uh, where the research led me. Unfortunately, nice. And then, is there any like takeaway that? Yeah. You the, yes, the takeaway I think is that um, the banking system, you know, the state uh, credit system, monetary system, and the and banks. Uh, are, are integrally tied together and very much a byproduct of, of state policy and, and politics in a way that we maybe aren't comfortable with or aren't taught in you know basic economics courses. Uh, the creation of money, the way that you know uh, banking is is supported, and the infrastructure of of the entire edifice relies on a whole bunch of federal government support mm-hmm. and subsidies and policy. And, and insofar as you have a you know, racially exclusionary system, insofar as you, you are excluding certain portions of the population, specifically uh, Black communities, mm-hmm. from the enterprise of democracy, um, you are also blocking them from any wealth accumulation, any of that capitalism, the, the, the way that capitalism is supposed to be, which is that you, know, you, you bring your goods to market and you sell and then you gain and your property is protected by law, that, that has not been the economy that the American system has had. Uh, it, is n- it has not been not capitalism. It has just been cap. It has not been. It has been state supported. Yeah. Something you know, and then real exclusions that were very anti-capitalist, right? Jim Crow, if anything, was uh, anti-capitalist. And and since then, I think too, there has been a lack of remedies. Um, and then and then of course there's the capitalist rhetoric used as a weapon to undercut these claims. Well, why don't you just you know, work hard and anyone who works hard can, you know, and, and so that, that is the pernicious aspect of it. <laughs> yeah. Got it. Great, 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 great. So, you know, a part of the book talks about black banks and then I would say the second part of the book, mm-hmm. you know, intimately looks at the wealth gap. And in the book, you say the wealth gap is where historic injustice breeds present suffering. Um, mm-hmm. And obviously this has been rooted in the enslavement of black Americans in the United mm-hmm. States. Um, I, you touched on this a bit, but how did chattel slavery have impacts or consequences of present day? You know, right. mm-hmm. I think there's just, there was what, over 200, 300 some odd years of slavery mm-hmm. in this country, even before the United States was the United States. And, mm-hmm. you know, post-Civil War reconstruction, all of a sudden, mm-hmm. you know, African-Americans are free, but mm-hmm. the reality is the starting point was mm-hmm. non-existent. So yeah. just curious mm-hmm. to get your take on. Well, it's not just slavery. I mean, it is yeah. It is also, you know, the the, the New Deal, the, the right. redlining, the specific, the racial covenants that lasted until 1970, the school segregation, the, the, the exclusion of Black men and women from trades, from schools, from neighborhoods with the law. The law was not protecting, not just not protecting Black property and Black businesses, but also the law was being used as a, as a mechanism to exclude 
um, uh, folks from these from these neighborhoods and trades and wealth me wealth producing functions. And so the way that it the sort of past injustices uh, breed present suffering is you kind of you know uh, I think about it as like you know you put you know flood water in a plain and you've got the hills and the valleys and the water just you know is going to go down to the valleys and and the hills are going to be you know saved and anytime you have some sort of like shock or whatever it is the it is like you know if you go to you know third world countries where, where I'm from or other places where you know, the rich people always live on the hill and then the poor people live in the valley because it's always right. flooded. It's always, you know, um, the place where the bad stuff goes, right? The sewage goes down and, and all this stuff. And and um, once you have that topography, it doesn't matter what kind of disaster or thing you put on top of it, the, the outcome is going to be the same. And and if you look at sort of racial injustice historically in, in America, you've created a topography of hills and valleys, right? Um, you can look at slavery. You don't have to go that far back. You can look at the redlined maps and segregation. You can look at the racial covenants, the HOAs, the, the way that certain schools in certain neighborhoods and the, and the capturing of wealth and access in certain places and in other places, the absolute absence of that. And if anything, the inhibiting factors. Right. Um, so you look at those valleys and you look at the hills and then you throw anything. You throw the financial crisis on it. And where are those subprime loans? It's in the valleys. You, you throw, you know, college access, you throw COVID, right? This racially neutral, colorblind virus that affects all human bodies similarly. And who gets most affected? Well, it's essential workers in black and brown communities. They're, you know, fewer hospital access, mm -hmm. you know, right? They're not getting the, the treatment and they are also on frontline workers. And, and you know, so, so you have more deaths in those communities, right? Why was that? Well, it was not a racist virus. Well, you don't need to keep doing racism once you have that topography, right? right. Um, and, and I think banking, um, cor corporate stuff, the way that that works is, is the same way. You know, I, I fundamentally disagree that, you know, banks or corporations are specifically greedy or specifically racist. I, I, I you know, I, I, you know, I think I have, you know, some students who are idealistic. who's like, how do I go work for a bank or a corporation that is not implicated in this? Like everything is implicated. Like you could be a sixth grade teacher and you are implicated in the structure of racism. Like you, you just live in this topographical map and, and, and it infects you. And, and so, so these, you know, if you're a bank that's lending, you're going to lend into this, this mix. Or if you're any sort of realtor, you're going to, you know, look at where the value is and, and guide, you know, your, your um, clients to that value. And so we have to look at the essential topography and then see how we are accelerating or not that, that, that water production or whatever the yep. natural disaster is. Very helpful. Thank you. Um, so next question, looking at post enslavement in the United States and looking at reconstruction and so on, it's all the different periods of time following slavery reconstruction going into Jim Crow. It's almost as if, you know, black Americans in this country is like fits and starts, fits and starts, right? Freedom, reconstruction for a good decade. There's advancements. We can air quote this get limited but advancements and then Jim Crow comes in, wipes a lot of those things away, um, including black businesses and the development of black businesses and building those out of, you know, coming out of slavery and then having your white counterparts effectively destroying that through, you know, burning mm -hmm. yeah. cities down, looking at Tulsa and other, you know, mm -hmm. black cities that were mm -hmm. created and made out of, you um, slavery and going into reconstruction. And I think there's a dangerous myth that we often have with like the American dream and the American ethos, like building yourself up, you know, by your bootstraps. And that doesn't necessarily um, correlate with everyone in this country. And when you look, you touched on this earlier, looking at specific banks, um, when you look at assimilation practices in America, your book mm -hmm. highlights how European immigrant communities at the turn of the century with the New Deal and so on and so forth, we're able to not only assimilate, but mm -hmm. benefit from the New Deal mm -hmm. in the 30s and, and moving forward. You know, mm -hmm. can you tell us, there's a good story in your book about looking at the Bank of Italy, right? And yep. essentially mm -hmm. how that was started out of necessity for a community, mm -hmm. just like mm -hmm. Black banks were started out of a necessity for a community and how Bank of Italy was then mm -hmm. essentially swarmed up into what is now present day Bank of America, but mm -hmm. a lot of your black banks as it still stands today are either dwindling, um, no longer yeah. exists, or they mm -hmm. didn't get the rights and privileges, so to speak, as other communities, particularly 
white communities in this country? Yeah, yeah. So um, th this is this is a big question, and and there's some negativity here, and there's some positivity here, right? Yeah. So the 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 idea of progress, I mean, there really is. I mean, there is there are gains, but there's backlash, and I think yeah. we 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 don't um, metabolize that backlash in the way that we tell that history, right? Reconstruction was overturned; it was overthrown right. by the Democratic staff. It was violently um, taken back that that structure. Um, and sharecropping is freedom technically from slavery, but it is another debt, you know, it, it arguably um, uh, just as bad for the people who, who lived it. Um, uh, so, so that's a, the side note, but on the Italian Irish and, you know, I look, you know, uh, this is a little uh, personal, but I, I am, you know, I, people are like, why did you write this book about you know, black banks? And, and I, I get this question a lot from like, you know, all black audiences, like what, you know, like they, uh -huh. sometimes they expect me to, you know, I've had several, you know, uh, elder black, you know, uh, Jesse Jackson is like, I, I thought you were black. Like what, <laughs> like, and, and, and then there's the, there's the, 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 the question I get sometimes from, you know, mostly white audiences is, is that what about the, what about the Asians? What about, the, my, the immigrants. And yep. that's where I can say, look, I, I am your model minority. Like I am a first generation immigrant, Middle Easterner, you know, came here, no problem, whatever. So like, right. that's where I can say like coming, I, I am telling you as that immigrant that it's, it's bogus. <laughs> it's bogus because whiteness is not, it's not a, a skin color. Of course there's discrimination. I'm not denying any of that. I mean, look at the anti-Asian right. hate crimes recently. That, that is a whole different bucket of things. There's discrimination, there's diversity. What I'm talking about here is a particular legacy of the racial wealth gap that is fixed in a black white system of, of economics. And the way that you can look at the shifting contours of this in the way that it affects economics is you look at how whiteness or white is not a, a, a reality. It is, a, it right. is a, an ever expanding label that you can apply to uh, groups of people who are in to that, that subset of, of uh, economic advantages or not. So who gets the Homestead Act? Right, who gets that FHA mortgage? And this is where the Italian, Irish, and Jewish experience is fascinating, right? Anti-Semitism is a whole different beast that I think deserves its own contemplation. But in the way that you look at the wealth, like who was able to buy at that house in Levitt Levittown, Pennsylvania, when that the FHA loans were given and the GI bills. And Italians and Irish who were as discriminated against as as anybody, right? Um, and 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 Jewish uh, immigrants in 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 uh, in tenements in the city, they all lived together. They were all getting paid the same. It wasn't that the FHA loans went to the middle class. It was a bunch of workers, all you know, wage workers. Some got this FHA loan, which was the the American dream, which was you're paying now instead of fifty dollars in rent, you're paying thirty five dollars on a mortgage in a nice quiet you know suburb um, with grass and with bowling alleys and your kids are going to the school and there's like the the American dream and who got that was you know the Italians Irish um, and anyone who was considered white based right. on these government forms and and that that's how whiteness expanded whereas in 1910 you have these race charts with like these pseudoscientists saying well Irish people like look at their skull sizes and look at their body measurements and they're not actually white they're like an inferior race Italian you know, Mongols, right? We are like a lower evolved um, set of people. And, and, and post, you know, 1930 New Deal is you have a bunch of court cases where people like me are saying, well, I'm from Iran. Is that like more Arab? Is that Mongol? So you're not white? Or is that more ca Caucasian? Because technically the Caucasus Mountains are, you know, so you have these judges actually deciding the parameters of whiteness and who's in and who's out. And Asians are an interesting mix and Mexicans are an interesting mix. But black was the, the standard not like you're that, right. that is not whiteness. And and right. and um and so so I think that like you look at those segregation patterns and you look at those exclusion and the way that those covenants were written and and the technical definitions, and, and that is essentially how Italians and the Irish became white, is, mm -hmm. is they could get that mortgage in Levittown. And, and I think that that's the negative. That's like the, the dirty, gross underbelly of it. Because I think it is, it really is an anti-Black racial um, spectrum. And yeah. the closer you can uh, get to that, the, the more you can get those. Um, back then, the FHA loan, but today, I mean, you can look at the neighborhoods, right? You can look right. at the, 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 the way that these, um, you know, race class uh, things work. But I think, you know, um, on, yeah, on that negative end, I think you have this wealth 
um, this two divergent economic systems, right? You've got the white suburbs creating wealth. You're also getting consumer credit that is revolving credit. You're getting credit cards, low interest loans. And in those black um, spaces, not only do you not have the mortgage and the equity building, the businesses are now leaving with the white right. people. Uh, so is the public transportation. And you have people like Robert Moses and all over cities across the country cutting you know, highways through because we're no longer bus public transport. We are now driving people and we're going to bifurcate all these neighborhoods. We're going to lead the cities of, of this, mm -hmm. you know, uh, the community. And then, by the way, when we change our mind and we want to come back into the city, you know, again, displacing um, those communities without a step in between of, you know, we had the civil rights movement in the 60s and we said, okay, you cannot do these racial covenants anymore. You cannot right. not give a mortgage, but we never did the, okay, let's fix that. Like right. we have these two scenarios. How do we remedy that? And that was essentially what every principle of the civil rights movement, you know, Johnson, Malcolm X, Martin Luther King, wherever you land on this was like, you have to bring people back up. And George Romney, by the way, there was Republicans, okay. Nelson Rockefeller, George Romney, who also got that because it was obvious you're not going to just say no longer discriminate and then everyone's good. Um, right. And of course, that's where the Nixon stuff gets really fascinating because yeah, was like, yeah. George <laughs> was the first HUD secretary, I believe. In, yes, that yeah. that yeah. that story kind of blew me away too. And there's all these memos from George yeah. Romney to, to Richard Nixon as HUD secretary saying, look, you know, he calls he calls the, the white ghetto a noose around the black or sorry, the white um, suburb as a noose around the black ghetto. And yep. he says, it's the government's job to fix it. So he writes these like explanatory letters to Richard Nixon saying, we have to integrate. We have to do some sort of uh, government program to like eliminate these, these disparities. And Nixon just kept trying to send him to Mexico and get him out of his administration because he's like, this is, this, you know, call him Mr. Integration. He, he, he went hard against Romney and Romney finally got the message and resigned um, and wrote this like, you know, really, you know, uh, passive aggressive or, you know, le letter to Nixon was like, thank you for showing me how the political process works or something yeah. like, yeah. you know, um, so yeah, that, that was a path not taken. Yeah, and you know, when looking at maps of cities and urban epicenters, mm -hmm. you know, it's the point post-civil rights and you see the building of the freeway system, a lot of freeways run through what used to be black epicenters and black communities. Mm -hmm. So almost kind of that point, right? Like we, there were these communities, they were growing and thriving to a degree, even if there were certain setbacks, but then, you know, government comes through, like builds a freeway to, allow mm -hmm. folks who are now in the suburbs to come, mm -hmm. you know, do that commute. And mm -hmm. um, I think within doing that to a degree um, directly impacted how communities thrive and how businesses and mm -hmm. capital and so on and so forth, you know, could have, mm -hmm. who knows where that, where communities would be if, if that were to have never have happened. Um, mm -hmm. And then, you know, speaking of black businesses and looking at the five largest black banks as they stand mm -hmm. currently um, have nearly $2 billion in assets. And, you know, when you initially look at that, that's like, that's a lot of money. Mm -hmm. But the reality is um, when you look at your bigger banks, I'm not gonna necessarily name names, mm -hmm. but your bigger financial institutions who have trillions of dollars in assets and mm -hmm. um, economists, civil rights organizations, business community members, so on and so forth, um, have called on policymakers to take a hard look at reparations, you know, there's HR 40 mm -hmm. that's been, mm -hmm. you know, wandering around in Congress forever now, but mm -hmm. there really hasn't been any movement. Um, mm -hmm. Curious to know your thoughts on why it may be absolutely imperative, you know, for policymakers to really get on board to just even study, you mm -hmm. know, a remedy, which is could be reparations to a degree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then curious, yeah, okay. like, what role? Because yeah. mm -hmm. we have clients on the call as well. What role business could play? And possibly mm -hmm. moving that conversation forward. Yeah, so I, I want to pin the business conversation. Don't let me forget it because I want to come back to this: what businesses can do. But on the role of reparations, I mean, look, I, I teach contracts. I've taught contracts every year for ten years, and uh, you know, we do damages. We do a whole section on damages. And if you go to law school, you take you can take courses on damages. You can do a whole. There's a whole variety of theories of damages, right? If you right. reach a contract, if you promise someone something and you don't do it, you can do restitution. You can do expectation damages, you can do reliance damages, and there's a whole variety of ways to repair, pay back that breach, right? We 
as a country, you know, made promises that were defaulted on to uh, the black population, right? 13th, 14th, 15th amendment and ongoing equal protection under the law, right? The protection from violence, all of this, you know, uh, access to, to loans. And, and so that has to be repaired. You can call it reparations, you can call it damages, you can call it truth and reconciliation, you can call it whatever you want, but every society that has had, uh, has been able to overcome something like this. I mean, I'm thinking mm -hmm. of, you know, there are several examples, but you know, Germany, look at South Africa. There was a process of tr truth and reconciliation, the Nuremberg trials. It's like this, we did this thing. And, and, the, and the thing that we did, we justified using mythologies and theories of racial inferiority and all of the stuff that was bunk. We did it because of power. We did it because of, you know, the, the, in the case of the Nazis, you know, just real kind of like global ambitions of nationalism or whatever it was. We did slavery because it was economically uh, profitable and useful to not have to pay for labor, right? right? I mean, right. we did redlining, you know, for, for a variety of other reasons, but the, the, then we justified it first with, you know, oh, well, it's divine right, and then that fell out of favor, and then it's like this pseudo-Darwinian, well, the racist and evolution, and and then we just stopped that thing, right? We stopped slavery, and we're like, but we didn't talk about, like, let's just discuss, you know, for hundreds of years, we convinced each other of this theory that Black men and women are not as human as white men and women, right? That was that was bull, and and here is our truth and reconciliation panel of scientists and people who who can show like these are the documents because they're there the receipts are there right how do we develop this myth of racial hierarchy and what did we need it for that's all there and and I think that that is the the thing that we have to do with reparations same with the civil rights era it was like the second those civil rights laws were passed it was like we are done 1965. And, and to be clear, like the Civil Rights Act, as monumental as it was, the voting rights law, as monumental as it was, were just guaranteeing the rights already provided in the 14th and 15th Amendment. I mean, th those were already rights that, 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 they sh that people should have had. Right. And now it was, look, the federal government is serious this time. We're going to enforce this. And then it was, you know, Roger Wilkins of the NAACP says in 1966, a year after uh, the civil rights, or uh, a year after the voting rights law was passed, that you couldn't pass the Emancipation Proclamation in this Congress right now. There had been such swift backlash. And, and this is the, the, the part of the civil rights story that people forget is Selma, all of the high flying stuff, that was all before 1965. By 1966, Martin Luther King is a pariah, right? Johnson is sure he's lost the election. He's like bogged in Vietnam, right? By 69, they were all assassinated or dead, right? And so you have a very swift backlash and, and it was the same with reconstruction. And there wasn't this, okay, now that we deregulated, we stopped doing Jim Crow, at least legally. Um, let's talk about how we justified Jim Crow for soul, how we built the society, how we didn't let black kids swim in these swimming pools because mm -hmm. we thought that they would dirty it up. Right? I mean, this is the truth, right? You can't drink from this water fountain. You can't have, you know, people marrying each other um, because we have these inferior races and then we're just gonna forget about it and just like right. move on. And, and I think that that's the point about reparations is like study it, you measure the damage, you measure it in economic terms. We know how to do that. Again, back to contracts law, we can do complex damages. We do 9-11 damages. We've done, you know, like opiate damages. These are not easy issues. Like they're wrongful death damages. Like you can't bring someone back, but you can calculate the loss. We will never repay to the black community um, the psychological, the economic, the emotional toll of centuries of racism. Right. But damages can can go some way in remedying. This stuff. Yeah. That's that's what the, the nugget of, of the law is. And so absolutely call it whatever you want, but that is absolutely ne necessary. And to go back to my point about the topography is we can keep dumping water in and until we flatten those planes, then it's still going to have the same outcomes. And so this is what reparations does is it flattens the planes. And, and by the way, there is a way to do reparations that isn't costly. You're not taking money from people and putting it in other people's pockets. It doesn't have to be that way. The FHA mm -hmm. is an example of a way to 
to you know do government supported programs that benefit certain populations at the, you know and not others but not at the expense of others um on the business side i think um douglas blackman's book um slavery by another name um he talks about convict leasing which i i i talk a little bit about in my book but you know where corporations post slavery took convicts that were you know arrested for like loitering and yes. put them to work in mines where they died and it was just another slavery essentially um, in that period and what he does at the end is follow some of that money into current corporations you know wachovia i don't know if anyone remembers that old firm um, wachovia coke i think u.s steel there's a couple other uh institutions that still carried that ill those ill-gotten gains and mm -hmm. he talks about a few processes within individual corporations themselves of that that remedy itself and, and it was before the georgetown i don't know if you followed the georgetown case of they, they having um, them having sold slaves and doing that reparations within georgetown's orbit is like we can right. provide scholarships to these descendants of of the people you know that we have enslaved or just descendants of slave slaves themselves so every corporation to the extent that they have their own history can deal with that in their own backyard in the way that they can expatiate, uh, you know, just kind of do that atonement within mm -hmm. within that organization. I think that is incredibly healthy and uh, a really good practice for, for folks to, to do. Good, awesome. Um, and kind of going into that, doing the work at home, you know, at Edelman for the past two decades, we every year we do a trust barometer that specifically looks at government, business, media, NGOs. And, you know, we know in order to win trust, brands must get their house in order. But again, like the reality is that some of our clients, as well as other financial institutions, are part of that, you know, traumatic history that is threaded throughout your book. Um, so as PR practitioners and the other Edelman, my Edelman colleagues listening, you know, how can we advise clients to do better? And, you know, obviously this past year with everything that has happened, Mm -hmm. um, and a lot of companies have these newfound commitments to DEI work, yeah. um, but have had these historically, you know, bad business practices. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, what advice would you give us, you know, yeah. to essentially mm -hmm. maybe have those hard conversations or getting a client from A to Z on why A, it's, it's more important than just statement, but yeah. actually really doing the real tangible work? Yeah, so I'll give you an example. I mean, I worked with Netflix a bit on, you know, um, uh, they, uh, an employee at Netflix read my book and uh, decided that they wanted to dedicate $100 million of their corporate assets into investments in, in Black-owned firms. And I helped them decide how, how to put those funds, because you don't want to just put deposits in banks. Any banker knows that banks don't need deposits, especially in this environment. They need these capital firms. And I, I worked with them a little bit in that. And and the thing with Netflix, and I, I kind of learned this as I had a lot of different conversations with the Netflix team, is that, look, Netflix is, is a company. I mean, Netflix is an entertainment company. Mm -hmm. And the thing that they do is um, within their own backyard of the thing that they do, they are actually um, trying very hard. They promote, they have a real diverse you know, um, personnel. Um, system. They have, you know, as far as their talent acquisition, their their offerings. I don't know. I mean, Netflix is, is the only thing that we will. I don't have any of the other HBO or whatever, but you know, <laughs> you, you saw for, for a long time, the content that they're producing is actually quite good. You know, the 13th documentary, you've got a, a slate of very um, diverse representation, good um, sort of content. And, and so I, 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 you know, the more I got to know about the company, I felt like really good about, this is not just like lipstick on a pig. Netflix wasn't trying to hide some horrible demon back there with like this 100 million, like they were, it wasn't like a, like a, yeah, like a bribe to like get the press to go away. It, it, it was genuinely like, this is a company that is committed to racial equity within its own domain and is also doing this in this other domain. Um, there are other companies, and I won't name names, who've, who've come to me where they're like, we want to do, you know, this, you know, whatever, like $10 million. And this is a you know, trillion dollar company mm -hmm. who has a legacy of exploiting those communities. And it's like, one, that that's a drop in the bucket. And that looks to me like you're just throwing money at this massive problem that you actually right. need to deal with in your backyard. So if you are a, you know, uh, you know, a company who has a legacy, a known legacy, or one that you could easily find out, right? We say like, just 
how how far do you have to dig to see that legacy? And if you don't want to dig, part. then that should say something, right? Um, you know, uh, I, I saw this at the University of Georgia, right? We were an institution with that legacy. We ha we were the seat of the Confederacy, and there was a lot. You know, there's, there's the best initiatives I think that the University of Georgia did were moments where they recognized it, they they unearthed it themselves, studied it, and put it out there, as opposed to hiding it and getting defensive about it. Right? Uh, there's a couple controversies that came up. You know, they dug up these slave bodies. Uh, bones in 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 the backyard of, of UGA as they were doing this expansion and it was this big fiasco because they just kind of like in the dead of night moved these bones and didn't didn't acknowledge deny denied until it came out with the press and and then they tried to do cover up and it's like if if you have that legacy if you're you know Chase Manhattan Bank for example I, I I'm saying that because that's there's examples in my book right. of Chase Manhattan taking money from you know Harlem and lending it downtown, um, you have you have a responsibility there to uh, you know deal with that legacy. Um, you know when you saw I saw you know Jamie Dimon kneeling in front of Chase Manhattan that that was not a pleasant image for right. if, if you know that history at all um, that that just looks like symbolism and so so I really do think it's company by company. But if you're you know uh, you know doing the thing that you do in a way that is equitable and well, then then by all means, all of your statements are going to seem right, right? I mean, you can see it. Like some companies will make a statement and people are fine with that. And some companies make a statement and there's an immediate reaction. And people aren't stupid, right? And they know like, what is the legacy of your firm? And some sometimes there are unearned halos and sometimes there are, you know, um, unearned stains. But for the most part, they, they track. Nice. Thank you. Um, so looking back at Black banks, and a lot of these banks have had to essentially merge together, essentially to survive. Um, I know in Washington, D.C., there's City First Bank, and in L.A., there's uh, Broadway Federal Bank, and together they now have, I believe, over a billion dollars in assets. Um, how do these banks in future public-private partnerships encourage people to bank with minority financial institutions, and what role do you see black banks playing, you know, and again, in your book talks about this as restoring capital, you know, going forward and what that may look like. Yeah, I mean, I, the role that I see, you know, I try to kind of talk about in the book is at any point where you're devising a, a, um, a remedy for the racial wealth gap, black bankers, black businesses should be at the head of that table with policymakers, with other corporations. The problem is that for much of our history, they've been the only ones in the room and that's not okay, right? Mm -hmm. You can't just be the onus of black banks to fix this problem that they didn't create, right? Um, and, and as far as, you know, how, how can we support black owned banks and black owned businesses? I think looking at the things that banks need to thrive, um, you know, it's not deposits. So this is why some of these, you know, bank black drives the black bankers you talk to, they're like, well, you know, like we don't need hundred dollar deposits from like right. every person in the country. That is actually a drag for them. That is, right. that is, if you know how banks work, you, you banks don't want your $100 deposit. That's a cost to them. But right. if you're a big corporation and you want to do a deal and, and a bank, a black bank has the capacity to help you with that deal, then, then go to them. The other thing I think is looking at your supply lines, right? Looking at where, where, whatever company you, you're representing, what market do you sort of dominate? Right. And looking at that market and saying, okay, let's say it's, you know, you have investment capital and you are often in talks with Goldman Sachs on whatever, proprietary trading, whatever you're doing, trading, derivatives, whatever. You go into Goldman Sachs and then letting the market work for you, saying like, well, we would like a all black investment team to do this deal. Uh, or your suppliers, like we, we would like, can you find a, a black owned firm that we would like to purchase all of this stuff from? Mm -hmm. Demand meets supply. That's sort of a lot of how it works. I mean, look at the, I mean, I do a little nugget in my book about sports, right? There's just long time where we didn't think, you know, black people could play baseball or right. boxing, right? And as soon as there was a demand, the supply comes. And I fundamentally believe that about entrepreneurs, about CEOs, the, the talent is equally spread out. And as soon as you have the demand, like I promise you, Goldman will hustle and get you that all black team and it will be as good, if not 
a better team than what mm -hmm. you had. And you do that across any market and you force that change as a, as a buyer um, or as a seller, you, you could also, but looking at your market and, and where can you force those changes, I think is useful. Thank you. Um, so, you know, in your book, you mentioned Homestead Act and looking at the future and possibly a Homestead Act 2.0. Um, mm -hmm. Do you think there's something like that that could be implemented to, you know, really address the generational unequal access to housing and wealth? Or will we just continue to find ourselves in a situation where Black Americans kind of remain in this constant state of playing catch up? Yeah, no, I mean, I think, look, the way that the racial wealth gap was created was across a bunch of agencies uh, in the federal government, local state governments, school districts, you've got, you know, uh, tax taxation, you've got credit policy, and it has to work across the board. So you, you can't just focus on one thing, but it has to be all those things. And, and, the, and the, the great thing is a lot of those things are connected. So your tax base feeds into the school funding, which feeds into the home ownership base, which feeds into the wealth producing ability of that neighborhood, which then feeds into like infrastructure projects that you're able to fund and public buses. I mean, it's, it's a whole like ecosystem of wealth on the one hand and then lack of on the other. Um, I actually did write up a homestead, 21st century homestead act. I don't know if you, you saw it, but I <laughs> mentioned it, but um, you know, I, I wrote it up just to just thinking about how what, you know, because I, I, I was asked by, um, you know, think tank Roosevelt Institute that, you know, they uh, are a this nonprofit, you know, and they were like, well, what, what would be your ideal thing that is achievable? I mean, my ideal is, again, study it across the board, measure it, do, do a whole scale project. But in housing specifically, there is a way to um, look at certain cities that have been formerly redlined, looking at those neighborhoods and the way that's, you know, there's, I use some historical examples of, you know, New York and other places where you have a bunch of properties and tax arrears where the city can land bank those, redevelop using federal treasury financing. And the, the, the trick there is that because it's long-term and it pays back into the coffers. So it's not, a ta you don't have to take, take it out of the budget in appropriations. You don't have to go to your um, to your population and say, pay us more taxes for this. You can just do it in a, in a way that bonds work, um, which is kind of magic if it pays off. Um, right. And then you redevelop a city like in Moss. So you do it the way that a lot of these, you know, like Seattle, like Microsoft coming into Seattle, like boom, now you have, you know, per, per one tech employee, you've got 10, you know, yoga teachers and baristas and restaurant employees, right? You, you, you create these add-on effects. And, and so that's the idea of, of my Homestead Act. And I wrote up all the little details in there if, if anyone wants to look at it. Nice, thank you. Um, you touched on this earlier when uh, Jesse Jackson was like, hey, I had no idea you weren't black, right? <laughs> but um, can you talk about how, or the importance of non-black people mm -hmm. um, advocating for restorative economic justice to, you know, mm -hmm. essentially mitigate, you know, systemic racism, right? Like yeah. you mm -hmm. essentially addressed how like, well, let the black banks do it. Like they can figure it out right. or, you know, when it, when the reality is, it's like, if some groups are left mm -hmm. out, you know, the economy is going to be impacted by it anyways, right? Like, you, mm -hmm. I was, there was a study last year, Citibank did, like, over, since 2000, because of yeah. racism, we lost $16 trillion in GDP. Um, mm -hmm. So just curious, you know, how it's not just Black Americans fight, but the reality is this impacts everyone. So how is a non-Black person can you can you know advise maybe our clients and, and folks on this call to help in that way? Yeah, yeah, in the same way. I mean, look, uh, I read once a book. Uh, it's called The History of Misogyny, written by a man, and he's like, "Why am I a man writing the history of misogyny?" And he's like, "Well, we invented it, so I thought I would, you know, <laughs> uh, write about it, right?" And you know, I, I think there's a way that you know um, this is not a problem that black communities created. That is not to say that like the leaders, the, 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 the people who are, you know, I mean, the people who are, should lead this are of course black voices, right? You don't want, you know, some, some white person coming in and be like, I got the answers, right? But, but there is, there's a lot of work. There's a lot of that good work. And that's what I try to do is to like, you know, look, W. Du Bois said everything there was to say in 1901 one in the 1908, the 1920. I mean, W. E. Du Bois's body of work is probably the best American history there is. And Eric Foner, you know, who wrote the the mm -hmm. you know preeminent work on Reconstruction, is just like I just rewrote 
Du Bois and updated it. You know, so so you actually have black leaders. I mean, James Baldwin. You've got several black economists that I look at: Andrew Brimmer, Abram Harris, um, Martin Luther King. I mean, that that you know, I, I I you could read Martin Luther King. Just you could have like a whole department just studying you know Martin Luther King's philosophy as like a just a a big thinker. Um, uh, same with I think Malcolm X and, and several of the other um, real big thinkers of the of the um, civil rights movement. So I, so it's not about you know other people doing the thinking or, or the voicing. It's just like joining along. Like these things have been said. You listen to these voices, and 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 it's not a problem that the black community created. So right. it's it's not something that it should be their onus to fix. I do think that. Um, we can take the lead of of these black activists, and I think I, you know I love you know some of the the, the ground up you know um, activism that has led to kind of this the societal shift where you're not like there's one person leading the way, but like a real just like zeitgeist, like a shift in understanding. And I I do think that that is happening again. I do think we're at a pivot point where white people are like I don't, I also white non white non black people like right. are, I don't want to live in a society that has these legacies that are unexamined and uh, undealt with. I, I as the, they, they may not affect me personally, but they do also. Like that stain, it affects all of us. I mean, so my, my favorite historian of the South, C. Van Woodward wrote this book about Southern history. And he talks about how he says, Jim Crow um, destroyed the soul, Jim Crow and slavery and the justifications used for it destroyed the soul of the South. So there was a soul, there was a Southern charm. There was a Southern thing, like not like, you know, gone with the wind kind of era, but there was something about Southern, you know, populism and that that cohesion and that agrarianness and Jim Crow and slavery destroyed it and left it just white supremacy, right? And so there, there is a way in which it, it harms all of us. It harms even the quote unquote beneficiaries of the right. society um, because they're now at the top of this very teetering thing where they have to like see the people in the valleys and justify their place at the top. And that is also a moral stain that I think we should not underestimate. Thank you for that. Um, just for the audience, this is awareness. Um, we will open it shortly here to um, questions for Marissa. Um, one final one from me and then we will open it up to the audience and also to to let the viewers know that you can submit questions anonymously so no one's name is going to be you know out there if you feel compelled or convicted to not um you know ask a question so um for you and you know you've written two books thus far and and, and you're obviously been speaking especially over this past year um where do you take your research next and you know what next opportunity will that look like for you is it another book is it you know obviously still being a professor just curious like is there going to be a part two of this <laughs> no no <laughs> yeah no um i you know i am up for a position maybe it's possible i will go into government it's possible i will stay in academia which is both really great things and if i do say i do have another book in the works it is not this it is more looking at the um the way that law, the, the sort of like the law and economics um, hold on the legal framework and corporate law and how, you know, we uh, just the, the basically rewriting that Nixon bit, but, but with from a theoretical corporate law stamp. I'm a banking law scholar. I'm not a race scholar. Right. I look at banks and I, you know, I think something fundamentally different in regulation happened starting in the 70s, 80s to now. And there is a rethinking of that banking structure. So I'll go back to that. I'll write about that. I teach, like I said, contracts property. Um, I think the, the 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 sequel to this, I mean, there's so much, so much great work. I mean, it's hard to believe me say it, but when I first sent this book to the publisher, there weren't a lot of books talking about the racial wealth gap or even redlining. I mean, I was going through 1930 sources and my book and The Color of Law were published the same month. We didn't, I didn't know of the book and he didn't know of mine. And, but I feel like since then there's been a lot of other scholars. And so I, I don't think that this needs to be done. Um, and I am really happy that I was able to like immerse myself in this research, but it was more for the broader point. I think that, uh, you know, I, I, um, I, I care about equity and banking. 
Thank you. Thank you. That's a great answer. Um, so I see a question over in the chat. Um, can you explain to us why some of the things you've suggested are good for business, even when your clientele is mostly older conservative clients? In other words, why should people care if they aren't black? Uh, okay, um, several things. So the Citibank study that you mentioned, um, there's a whole book, there's, there's several books. Racism costs all of us. It costs us financially, it costs us emotionally, the moral toll of it. Um, the, the, I mean, I don't know what your thoughts are of the Trump, I don't know what your client's thoughts are of the Trump election, but nobody can say that that was like a good healing thing for the country to have gone through that level of polarization. And a lot of that I think does come to um, these, these old haggard ideas of race. And so, you know, as far as talking to older clients, I, you know, I, I, I think that there is a, a plea to um, just their like a sense of morality and justice and, and a rewriting of this, of this story. Like America isn't just Slavery, Jim Crow, you know, native uh, exploitation, and 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 uh, you know what we did, the, the, the uh, you know dispossession. It is also, you know, the a, a country built on this foundation of being the scrappy, up and coming. You know, all men are created equal. We, we do have these two threads here, and I think really looking at and this is the the, the brilliance of Martin Luther King and and W. E. Du Bois, right? Uh, Martin Luther King said like looks to the documents, our founding documents, the Declaration of Independence, and the Constitution says, look, these promises, we we believe this, and we are here to say that there's there has been a, a gap here in the promise and the, and the action. And and I think just just that's why this history is important. Just it's just a narrative to show it. You can give them my book if you like. The 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 footnotes are there, but just say like look, this is not about you taking some anti-racist, you know, seminar where you, you, ha you have to like, you know, learn all the new language. I mean, I, I admit to being old, older than some of that, where sometimes this language shifts on me and I feel like I'm keeping up and I do try to keep up, you know, but I can see someone more old be like, I, I just, you can't say anything right. And like, don't worry about what you say. Just, just um, let me just look at this history in a way that you weren't taught it before. Um, and 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 if you care about morality, if you care about this country and patriotism, then then you you will want to um, remedy this. Um, as far as businesses, I mean, I do think I was going to mention uh, quickly this you know this new Delta um, initiative with the voting rights. I mean, I think businesses, you know, um, you don't have to tackle anti-racism if 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 you feel like the business or the client isn't ready for that. Go for the stuff that matters in a way that. Is also anti-racist. I mean, voting rights is very racially um, embedded in this country, right? Um, and the way that the Georgia legislature is, is, you know, taking away the vote matters, right? Um, it matters racially. It is a racial, racist backlash. It's clear. And what Delta said is like, you know, this is a corporation that says no. You know, we we believe in democracy, and and so you know, you don't have to say anything about race. Uh, because they didn't when they're restricting voting, they're very clear it's not about race. And so, right. so you also don't have to make it about race, but you do say, we believe in democracy, we believe in the vote. And if you believe in democracy and the vote, these laws are diminishing that. And, and so that's a shared enterprise. And I think Delta did, it, did a really good job because that Georgia legislature is, will listen to Delta. And um, so I think that uh, was, was effective. Um, here's a good one. Uh, do you think there will be more, more concerted efforts for companies with endowments and retirement accounts to partner with black owned firms so that they, so that the management of money isn't just circulated within the same people? I think so. I think, um, you know, I'm, I know, I know Gary Gensler at the SEC and he has like a commitment for, uh, to diversity. I know that a lot of, I've talked to a lot of, you know, investment managers. I was on the Biden transition team and we, we talked to lots of, you know, SIFMA and a lot of these organizations who brought up themselves. Like we, we care about this stuff and we are looking to put our funds in these, um, in these, uh, uh, black owned wealth management. So, so I think top to bottom, there is a shift happening. And, and I, I, I do absolutely think that that's an important one. Nice. Um, someone said one more, I guess we have about five more minutes or so. Um, 
the question says, I was listening to Resma Minikin, oh, a yes. black therapist. In oh, Trump I read everything. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. He said that we run to strategy and to paraphrase, mm. this prevents us from feeling it. Can history help us feel and really experience one another as human beings? Oh gosh, well, I, I, you know, I just listened to the Resma Menachem uh, interview with on being Krista Tippett, uh, and it blew my mind that interview. If, if you haven't listened to his on being Krista Tippett is a podcast, Resma Menachem. That, that that's just a one podcast. I read his whole book. I, I've read, I've listened to him in a lot of places, and and he talks about the 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 sort of um, intergenerational trauma that is a legacy that we pass. Um, uh, uh, forward and both, you know, white and, and black and, and the way that we, we hold these traumas. And there's a lot of science here to back this up, you know, not just trauma research, but also, you know, epigenetic research and, and not some of it is, is junk research. So I, I want to be clear that what it's not saying is like, it's, there's no DNA right. races, you know, but it is about, you know, the, the, the way that, you know, if you have like an, a famine in Hungary, your your grandmother had famine, you know, uh, her grandchild can experience some of that trauma in, in certain ways, you know, uh, that legacy. And he talks about, you know, the, the those racial legacies and the way that we carry that trauma. Um, I absolutely think that, and then this is where I think it bolsters the point of like that healing. I think healing those traumas is, is for everybody. Um, it is for, you know, it is for police, like look at police brutality, for example, like police are not, they are doing a job that we as a society hire them to do. Right. And they, they are the, the purveyors. I, I, I think that it is traumatizing to be a police officer. And in a way that I think we as racial justice advocates have to recognize that, that they are doing the, the job of, you know, both white supremacy and criminal enforcement. And that, and that the way, and not, this is not an excuse for, you know, the, the killing of George Floyd. This is at all, not about the brutality, but there is a trauma that is like hurt people hurt, you know, that, that, that old saying, um, but, but, but this stuff goes really deep. And I do think it's important. And this is a, I don't want to get too woo woo here because I don't believe in it, but it is scientifically felt, you know, you feel um, a, a, a certain way. I mean, I, I um, can you imagine walking to school and, or, or having to be a black man who had been, you know, beaten up by the police and having right. to walk what what does your body do around policemen you know I, I had a law student who said this to me once it just kind of like blew a light bulb in my brain where he was like he's gotten stopped this was over the weekend he was at a croaker in georgia and he got stopped by a cop and he kept walking and he's like i knew then and i knew then that he could kill me because he wanted me to stop i was walking out of croaker with my girlfriend i was nothing wrong he's a law student right um you know and he was like, but it was the 11th time I had been stopped by a cop. And I felt like my dignity, I could not stop. Mm -hmm. And I knew that like, if I got shot, it would be my fault because I was, or according to like the way that his elders had taught him, like you always stop, you always respect. But, but there was something about like his felt trauma about that, that he's like, I, I refuse to do it. I refuse to stop. I'm going to walk to my car. And it just felt to me like, oh, like, yes. Right. To never have experienced that in my body and to not know I, mean, I had a car accident when I was 16 where I skid every time I skid, I, I feel that, there. you know, yep. and so that that's what it reminded me of. It's like, imagine if like every time, right, that that was a re-traumatizing thing. So, so I think t taking that seriously is is for all of us. Awesome. Thank you. Um, another question came in. From uh, let's see, hold on, sorry, we're scrolling down. One theme I saw in the book was a frustrating pattern of one step forward then two steps back for black banks and building black wealth. How can we make sure the progress we're fighting for right now actually sticks, sticks and stays? Um, yeah, uh, um, holding people accountable. I mean, I think, um, you know, it's it's hard, it's, it's hard to be, pessimistic when you look at reconstruction, you look at civil rights and you look at the backlash that happened. Um, at the same time, I do think that Italian and Irish example is a positive one where you didn't actually have to change hearts and minds about the Italian and the Irish. You just gave them that FHA loan and within a generation, and maybe this goes back to the elder clients, like maybe some people have to just die off 
and the new right. blood comes in and they just don't have those stigmas you know like you talk to like elders in different countries where you know like the way my grandmother sometimes talks about like the turks you know and it's like what what do you like this this is not a people that we recognize right and it's because they were blended in and assimilated into the iranian populace like long ago you know but there was that that generational thing that was like a thing for them and and i i think that that that's what happened with italians and irish in america and we could through policy and through movements make that also just a situation of race i mean it seems so far-fetched right now um but you know i do try to end on a positive note in the book with the horse thing right like in london in 1850s they were like if we you know in another 10 years all the streets will be covered in like horse poop right we won't be able to have any commerce it'll just be stagnant horse poop and then right. of course we have a car um so i so i think you can quickly shift these things um and and do it do it in a way that we, we were can you imagine like not being able to marry someone of a different race but you know that was our parents mm -hmm. literally up until like the late 60s early 70s literally, um, yeah let's see i think that's it for now as far as questions going once going twice i mean we are at the top of the hour so um i mean i guess Anyone else? I haven't seen a lot of the questions were overlap questions. So um, I think I think we're good. So Marissa, thank you. I don't know if you have any closing comments or remarks, but this has been a long time coming. And um, thank you for taking an hour out of your busy schedule to be with us, to be with our clients, to be with listeners and viewers. Um, I've seen a lot of in the comments here that this has been fantastic and terrific. So thank you. Um, thank I don't you. Know. Thank you. This was so, so great to talk. It's, it, you know, you, you've, you've dug so deep into the book and I really appreciate a, a conversation where, you know, we, we don't have to start from basics. So I, I really appreciate that. And um, please, you know, do reach out if, if anyone needs more help, read the book first, because then we can talk about, you know, um, beyond that. Yeah. <laughs> yes. like, highly recommend. Um, yes. Lex, I know you're still on the line. I don't know if you wanted to close anything out or any thoughts, comments. Sorry, removing my mask. Um, Marissa, actually, my, I, I did have a question for you if you have one more minute. Yeah. yeah. So in the book, the Freedmen's Bank was like a big, that chapter, chapters was a big aha moment for me. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then later there was some stories about banks in Chicago and what they faced from a regulatory point of view, mm -hmm. the uphill battle and how no other white owned banks faced that same constraint. But I was just curious, was, was there a chap, is there a, one, a piece of the history that you wrote about that was particularly, you know, like important to you that really stood out for you? Oh, um, gosh. Um, yes. I mean, a lot of it, the Freedmen's Bank, you know, Frederick Douglass, reading Frederick Douglass's memoir of becoming bank president. I mean, the guy, you know, he's out of slavery. He becomes bank president. He says, I went from being a slave boy to being bank president. He's like, and he, he walks, you know, in front of the, the Freedmen's Bank and is like, you know, he, and he has all these amazing biblical imagery, like the queen of Sheba could not have imagined the riches. And, you know, he was so proud of his people and the tellers at the bank. And then he becomes president and it's a, it was run by a white manager who basically looted the bank from money. And Frederick Douglass gave $10,000 of his own money to the bank, thinking that he could save it as it was already bankrupt. And then has to go tell Congress, Frederick Douglass himself has to go tell Congress to decharter the bank because now it's just taking money from people. And and yet he's, he can't help but be, be so proud of the way that like, look, black people can bank, like, of course, you know, but, but, but coming from that slave owner society to become a, becoming a bank president, but also having to like, see this horrific failure um, from the good guys, like the union generals did the Freedmen's Bank, right? And um, that, that was the, it was Lincoln. I mean, Lincoln wasn't involved, obviously, he was long, long dead, and, and neither were the, you know, Sherman and Grant, but um, this was the good guys. And, and so I, I was heartbroken. Um, du Bois, I think, really put a fine point on it in his book, you know, talks about the Freedmen's Bank failure. I, I think it's hard for us to get how big of a blow this was, but you're talking about sharecropping South, where 
the, the gains are so hard won. And you put your money in this Friedman's savings account, which you're, it's better than getting your land that you were supposed to get because that was reparations. That's the first reparations that we should have done is give the land. And uh, they didn't. So they're like, oh, we'll just save your money. This is better. And then that money's gone. Right. And so Du Bois really, I mean, he talks to people, he said, not even, you know, 10 additional years of slavery could have done so much to have harmed like the spirit of the freedmen. Right. Because these are psychological things. And banking, as, as any banker knows, it's about trust. I mean, now it's about FDIC insurance and all that stuff. But back then, it's about trust, you know, and people just lost trust in the government, in banking, in their leaders. Um, and it was a real um, stigma and it was a blow that. I, I, I was reading bankers interviews in the 70s, 80s, 90s that were saying, because of the Freedmen's Bank, my grandfather, grandmother told me not to invest in a bank. And so that legacy sort of permeates. Um, and it was just a forgotten story. I, I didn't, hadn't known about it. Um, in fact, the Treasury Department in 2016, I think, renamed a wing, uh, the Freedmen's Bank wing, you know, and I thought it was an overly celebratory um inauguration they were like this shows the great things that the government can do and i was like oh like that's you know yeah. the, the, the lessons are mixed right it, you know um but good ones thanks for that question it, it, i thought it was a heartbreaking chapter to write yeah and just an additional comment it's a motivating chapter when you start to see what really happened and how deep this goes all of us on this call need to be motivated in order to create a better future. This isn't just about education. We need to be motivated and committed. And reading about that reality is an important part of that for those you know, who, who can be educated in that way. I also, Mar Marissa, just to provide the benefit to others, before the call started, you offered another book, uh, The Some of Us. Yes, which... uh, by Heather McGee. Mm -hmm. And it was about, it's about what racism costs all of us across sectors. So schools, colleges, what we all lose because we, we have historically supported race-based policies. And we all as in the entire, all, of, all Americans, not just the black population. And she talks about, I mean, she uses the, the beginning example and that's why the swimming pool thing came to mind is people, Southern communities would rather drain the swimming pool. Nobody gets a swimming pool than integrate it, right? And so a lot of her examples come down to that. Like we would rather not have this thing than, than have you know, the, the black kids swimming in the pool. And there's several examples that she gives that really brought that point home. Healthcare, taxes, schools. It was really, it's a really great uh, tool, uh, researched book. Marissa, I wanna thank you one more time. I wanna thank everybody that's participated. Ashley, I wanna thank you one more time. Um, and Thank acknowledge you, this important topic. I hope, I hope we continue the discussion in other ways. Marissa, I hope we can continue engagement with you in whatever way is appropriate, uh, but thank you for all of your work and sharing of knowledge. Likewise, thank you so much for having me. Thank you, Marissa. Thank you, Lex. For... Thank you, everybody. Thank you, everybody. Have a good night, everyone. Have a good night.